In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, was the light of all mankind. I'm sorry. In Him was life, and the life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light, he came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was, the, uh, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to, be, to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth through Jesus Christ our Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. God, may your word be a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. Tune our hearts and minds to respond to the quickening and the move of the Spirit in our midst. Hide me behind the cross as I speak, that they will, all of us will not hear the voice of men, but will hear the, the messages to which you, Jesus, wants us to take today. Be with us in Christ's name. Amen. When you read the book of John, John has the nativity story. The nativity story of John does not, doesn't begin with the shepherds and the angels and the baby wrapped in a swaddling cloth, lying in a manger. John's nativity story takes us back to the beginning of creation. Back to the time when he echoes from the creation, from God's creation in Genesis. In, in, in John's gospel, the very God who created the heavens and the earth and who breathed life into Adam was the same God who became flesh and lived amongst us. Jesus is the exact representation of God's nature because God himself was in Christ. And John proclaim that he who comes is he who has been from the foundation of the earth. And so imagine John the, the Baptist standing in the wilderness in the middle of nowhere and people are coming to him to be baptized. People are coming to him and he proclaims, for the kingdom of God is come. For the kingdom of God is come. And he went, as people flee towards him, he started warning them. He said, hey, you brood of vipers who want you to flee from the wrath that was about to befall you. Honestly, I, I, when I read this scripture in John, I'm kind of stunned. Who will go hear a radical, crazy preacher? 
And not only radical, he wasn't having the largest cathedral where he says, come to me and I'll pray prosperity on you, which is great. There's nothing wrong with large cathedrals. But he was in the wilderness declaring the kingdom of God is near. You see, John was prophesying and saying the incarnation, God the incarnate one, God who created the heavens and the earth is making his dwellings amongst men. God who created you and I is coming to dwell in you. And people were fleeing to John to be baptized. And John baptized them of course with water. And so when John says, I baptize you with water, but he who comes will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And because, you see, the, let me give you a little bit of a background of what, when you look at uh, the story of John, that, that really stands out. You see, prior to Christ's birth, there has been 400 years of silence since any prophet spoke. And I think there has been a longing for people, longing to know when can God speak to us again? Could that be why everybody was fleeing? Finally, we are hearing the word of God because God has been silent. Could that be why they were fleeing to John? I don't know, but I want to, I am convinced that there was a yearning, there was a longing for a deeper connection. There was a longing for knowing that, you know, man and woman has a void that needs to be filled up. And so the longing is to be filled up with something that we cannot fill with. The longing is to be filled with something that material possession cannot fill it. The longing is for something that my bank account cannot not fill it. And the people run to John to get this. And you see again, prior to that, when uh, uh, prior to the arrival of John, Alexander the Great has created all these highways, and the, lang the Greek language is spoken in so many places, and the Jews have been dispersed across the world, and so that makes the gospel kind of really permeate. I, while I was preparing this sermon, I kind of can't help myself but think about the internet highway. How so much the internet has permeated every fiber of society. And I want to believe that the re part of the reason why the internet has permeated or is God allowing the confluence when the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit, that God through the Holy Spirit can use even the internet to reach people in the remotest part of the earth, beginning from our own neighborhood. And so Alexander the Great had created all of this highway. So it made proclamation of the gospel easy. It makes people to be able to travel from city to city. And it makes the early disciples to go from synagogue to synagogue. Because there were church, there were synagogues everywhere. And so the gospel could be preached in those synagogues. First for the Jews and then the Gentiles. And John was kind of looking through the mind of Christ and saying someone greater than me is coming whose sandals I'm not worthy to even untie and so when Jesus came and finally walked the earth and finally came to be baptized can you imagine what people would be saying at that point oh he we know him he's the carpenter's son Oh, he's Mary's son. Oh, that's his brother James. How can he be the Messiah? He cannot obviously, uh, he cannot obviously be the one that is sent of God. Because the expectation is the Messiah will come in a white horse. The Messiah will come and conquer Rome. The Messiah will come and set up his physical earthly rulership. Where all the thrones of the governments around the world will bow before him. But the Messiah does not come in that form. We all know it. The Messiah comes to us individually. He reveals himself to you. 
He reveals himself to me. And in that revelation, when I catch the vision of the incarnation of God within me, then it begins to transform my life and transform my work that wherever I go, I cannot hide the incarnation power of God that is at work in me. But it reflects, it's kind of like you have a flashlight in your hand and you have it flashed, uh, turned on, you cannot hide, the, you cannot shield the flash the brightness of the flashlight because the brightness of God that is in you cannot be quenched but it all begins with that personal understanding of the power of the incarnation the incarnation is a real story and it's personal like I said, it is not something that you say, Oh, by and by, I have heard Jesus came and walked this earth. Yes, I believe it. Yes, I know it. But Jesus longs to come into me and walk this earth through me. Jesus longs to come through you and walk this earth with you. So that wherever you go, you are the embodiment. I am the embodiment of Jesus carrying, reflecting the Holy Spirit of God at work and let me say this this is by no means saying oh finally now I've got Jesus I'm perfect no I've got Jesus that means I'm a work in progress because the scripture through the Holy Spirit reminds me when I step out of line and convicts me and bring me to that point of realizing that oh I have been saved by grace not by my work so that any man can boast as we know in when you read in Ephesians 2 it says for by grace have you been saved not by work so that any man or woman can boast that I accomplished this myself because the grace of God is available to you and to me. And the grace of God has been given to us freely. So when we imagine the incarnation of God in this earth, here is a story. A father put his four-year-old son to bed. Having finished prayers, stories and all the little bedtime thin, uh, things that he kissed his son and turned the light off, his son started sobbing. Don't leave me. I'm scared. And don't want to say, uh, stay here alone. The father tried to encourage the little boy by reminding him of God's presence. And reminding him that, he had the, that, that they have just had a devotion. The little boy said, I want somebody with skin on to be here. I want a physical presence of you, daddy. For those of you that are parents, you know what that means. When you read all those bedtime stories to your kids, and the next thing is you're about, you just, you thought maybe they're sleeping, you begin to tiptoe to sneak out of the room. You tip, you, you, you flip the switch to pull off, and the child says, Daddy or mommy, and you go quickly retreat back to and say, Yes, I am here. But can you imagine God's embodiment present with you all the time, present with me all the time? It gives this, uh, this just like the story in this little boy, the little boy longed to have his physical, of his father's physical presence. Relate that to the presence of Jesus in you, in me, in the world that we live in. The incarnation, it simply teaches that Jesus was all of God. That God became man in the person of Jesus. Jesus had all the authorities of God and say uh, uh, to do and to, to say and to do things. He created all things. Just we're, like we're reminded in Colossians. He says, for by him were all things created. Things that are in heaven and that are on earth. Visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions. Or principalities or powers all things were created by him and for him 
That means he knows all things. That means God, know, God knows everything about you. God knows everything about me. Even those little secrets that we try to dust it off and try to hide it because my friends don't see it. God knows it. God knows every detail. It's kind of like when I say to my daughter, go clean your room. Oh, she will come back. Uh, uh, Bo, by the way, that's Bo's act. She knows how to clean her room. She's the fastest cleaner I have ever seen. And she cleans really good. So she will go into her room and shove everything under the bed because they're not in plain sight. And so she'll tell me, Daddy, come and see. I've cleaned my room in. I'll go, wow, that was quick. She said, yeah, I'm a hard worker. Only to show up and look under the bed and all of the jing jang is being trashed under the bed. But in this case, imagine, you know, sometimes in our life we're like the little girl or the little boy that knows how to clean their room and we want to shove everything under the bed that cannot be seen when you step in the room. God knows every single detail of you and me that we don't have to hide it and the same God the incarnate the incarnate one said to us that all things in heaven and on earth has been given unto me and guess what he said he said therefore go and make disciples of all nations and I will be with you till the very end of age so what that simply means is I am the embodiment a carrier of Christ crucified in the world that I step in because he has promised he will never leave me nor forsake me God longs for us to have such a divine revelation of who he is Jesus the incarnate one does not depend on anything around to show up he shows up but the question is have you really given him the room to rule and reign have I given him the, ru the room the freedom to rule and reign because he longs to do that that is why Jesus says for behold when we read in Revelation he says I stand at the door of your heart and knock if anyone opens the door I will come in and sup with him and I'm not talking about oh because you need to be born again alone no born again is it's a primary but I'm talking to church folks that I know you've fought, you've you've at one point you've had an encounter with Jesus but it doesn't stop there the encounter needs to grow deeper it needs to be every day allowing Jesus into your life allowing Jesus into your heart to sup with you have you accepted that opportunity now I'm not asking oh are you born again it goes deeper than being saying I've said the sinner's prayer you know we've been so made to understand that if I've prayed that sinner's prayer I've accepted Lord Jesus the recited prayer it's kind of like the man that sits around his dining table and writes out the prayer and when they sit at the family at the table to eat he'll say God check that out and then eat God wants to be so revealing to you God wants to care for you I want to invite you this morning like the writer of Paul writing to the Philippian church, he says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in very nature, in, in, in the form of God, though did not, is not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon the form of a servant. Jesus, though God, did not consider it something to be proud of but humbled himself and became obedient to death you and I have been invited to such a great honor to understand the revealed God not to go out and puff ourselves and say we are better because we have a church we go to or we are part of a church we're part of Rockford Community Church 
but that we humble ourselves and become obedient to what the leading of the Holy Spirit says. My prayer is that I don't want you to leave this place wondering about your assurance of knowing Jesus. But I want you to ask yourself this question. Do you or have you understand the incarnation story in your own personal journey? Yes. Because Jesus wants to have want you to have such a personal daily encounter in all that you do, in all that you say, in all the places that you go. And when Jesus takes the reins, I tell you, like Paul says to the Roman church, what will separate us from the love of God shall trouble, shall hardship, shall peril. He says, know ye not that nothing shall separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Friends, I invite you this morning that as we pray, that you'll remember that nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Take a moment and just reflect on these words that you've heard this morning. And so God, we know you, your ears are never tired of hearing us. We know that you are never, as we go this week, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you and be with you. Amen. Amen.